My name is Davide Rochesso. I'm presenting a work that I've been doing as a supervisor of Giovanni Capizzi during preparation of his master thesis in computer science at the University of Palermo, with significant help from Stefano Baldan. The topic is that of extracting trajectories out of the time frequency representation of sound, and we propose using a technique that is derived from image processing, where it is known as scene carving. When transposed to audio, scene carving has some nice perceptual properties that we will highlight. Um, the overall purpose that we have is that of extracting the most prominent sinusoidal components from a sound or from the time frequency representation of a sound so that we can extract structure from sound, manipulate the sounds and eventually come up with new designed sounds. But in image processing, scene carving was introduced in 2007 by Avidan and Shamir as a, a technique for content-aware image resizing, that is changing the aspect ratio of an image without changing the proportions of the most significant objects that are depicted in the image. The idea is that in the image there are areas that have uh, high energy where the, um, the um, objects are and areas that, are, that have low energy. And we can extract vertical uh, seams or um, areas of lower energy out of the image. We can carve them out one by one. By one. And uh, in this way, we get an image that uh, is resized, but preserves the proportions of the most significant objects that are depicted there. Uh, how is that done? Well, algorithmically, <clears throat> Uh, or mathematically, a, um, a seam is a collection of couples, i and xi. i is a row index in the image, and xi is in position, uh, position within the row, and there is a constraint uh, between uh, adjacent positions, uh, positions in adjacent rows that are at most distant by uh, one pixel. And we have a notion of energy in the image so that we can accumulate energies along a seam. In this case, we are considering vertical scenes, like this line, and we are accumulating these energies. Um, the optimal seam is the one that minimizes this accumulated energy. Uh, typically, the energy is derived by preprocessing the image so that the um, contours are highlighted, so they have high energy, and the uh, seams go around these contours, so areas such, such as this get uh, eliminated or carved out. Algorithmically, this is done uh, like this. It's done with dynamic programming, so to be uh, efficient enough. Uh, and uh, uh, with dynamic programming, we construct a matrix that contains the minimal costs for all possible seams. So for each pixel in position ij, we want to sum the local energy at that pixel with the minimum of the three energies in the neighboring pixels in the row above it. Okay. And this gives the new value of the accumulated energy position ij. For example, in this position, the new value is 8, which is the local energy 5, plus the minimum of the previous uh, accumulated energies, which are 4, 3, and 5. The minimum is 3, so it's 5 plus 3 equals 8. We can repeat this process row by row until we reach the last row, and then we can find the minimum in the last row and proceed backtracking to find out, to recover the mean. So the backtracking for seam removal. This is essentially the algorithm. In audio, uh, this is not the first work that proposes seam carving. Uh, first time um, audio seam carving was probably proposed by Taramaso in his um, master thesis at UPF Barcelona for an application of time scaling with preservation of tempo and attacks. Uh, so in that, in that case, in a time frequency plane, uh, it was performing a vertical uh, seam carving. Uh, Barnwell and others in 2012 and 2013 uh, proposed using seam, audio seam carving to uh, extract feature vectors as signatures of human voice and to estimate the speed of vehicle passical, passing um, just by audio recording. But the most interesting uh, reference in, in audio seam carving is quite recent, it's by Tzu and others. And it's um, quite close to what we are pre presenting here. Their uh, purpose was that of multi-trace frequency tracking and signal separation. They were able to prove that, uh, that this approach is better than probabilistic methods. Um, algorithmically, their method is a, a bit more um, 
time consuming, there are hours, and it uses regularization that we don't use. We weren't aware of this uh, reference when we were doing this work, indeed. In uh, uh, audio, uh, to perform SIM carving, uh, we use the magnitude spectrum, MX, uh, as a measure of local energy. And the uh, accumulated energy is uh, uh, computed in uh, exactly the same way as in image processing, uh, with the only difference that the function is a max function. So we add the local energy at position ij in the time frequency plane uh, with the maximum of the uh, accumulated energies in the previous row. But for the rest, the, the procedure is the same, with the uh, caveat that usually we uh, lay down time in the horizontal axis and frequency in the vertical axis, so that we are interested in horizontal uh, seams. So we, ha we have to rotate the procedure by 90 degrees, but this is a detail. Um, just a simple application uh, of scene carving to an impact sound, like a bell sound such as this, produces an energy matrix such as this one. And if we ask the algorithm to extract the most prominent seams, 40 seams, it extracts these uh, lines that uh, permit resynthesis of the sound. But the nice thing is that scene carving works pretty well for uh, any kind of sounds, not, not only for uh, decaying uh, impact sounds, but also for sounds whose frequency components uh, wiggle around widely, such as this or this. And in this case, this is uh, the extraction of eight scenes for these two examples. Still, we can see that in some areas, the uh, following is not that good, just because there's the limitation of plus one or minus one uh, pixels in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, which is not enough to follow the steep curves, the steep uh, frequency deviations. But what can we do? We can simply extend the neighborhood to five elements or to seven elements. This will introduce a uh, higher computational cost, but it, it will allow following steeper trajectories. As in this case, you can see it follows uh, the um, most prominent sinusoidal components uh, much better. Of course, the behavior of the uh, audio scene carving depends on uh, the parameters of the STFT, of the short time Fourier transform uh, for spectrogram computation, which are the window size, uh, the DFT length, the window length, and the overlap or hop size. Uh, all of these parameters affect uh, the behavior of scene carving and the quality of final results for some parameters. Uh, it may be that the, the following is, uh, stops working at a certain point, like here. Um, but in general, we, one can find a, a large set of parameters that uh, permit the reasonable behavior of the, uh, of the algorithm. And the computation, um, the number of, of operations is also affected by the parameters of the STFT. The total number of comparisons uh, is given by this formula, where n is the number of beams, m is the number of, pre of frames, and k is the number of uh, elements in the neighborhood, for example, five uh, pixels or seven pixels, etc. So this is the dominating complexity um, that is required for the construction of the accumulated energy matrix. For backtracking and scene cancelling, complexity is proportional to m, so it's less relevant than this. This is the experimental measurement of computational time uh, for uh, three different uh, values of m, which is window length, and uh, for different values of overlap. Um, the most uh, straightforward application is the derivation of parameters for um, decaying resonances, like for impact sounds, which are amplitude, frequency, decay time. This is an example of uh, the amplitude of an extracted seam and uh, the computation of the decay time by backward integration and regression. So when uh, these parameters are extracted, one can resynthesize impact sounds uh, with the sort of model synthesis. And, uh, and the sounds can be manipulated so, so that a bell can be actually resized and made larger. And this is the direct transposition of the concept of image resizing in image processing. This is audio resizing, but object-based resizing, uh, mediated by scene carving. 
there are, of course, uh, other techniques for uh, uh, following the uh, most prominent sinusoidal components in the time frequency representation. Probably the most widely used and known is the peak tracking by Nicoli and Quatieri, proposed in 1986 and then used and extended by Sarah and Smith, which proceeds by a first stage of peak picking, that is the extraction of the peaks from the single frames of the um, Fourier uh, transform of the short time Fourier transform. So frame by frame, it's there's peak picking and then peak to peak matching between frames, between adjacent frames, which uh, turns out to be quadratic in number of peaks and the construction of uh, uh, tracks that are uh, initially quite short. The, the, there are dead and born tracks. And then some heuristics can be used to uh, extend and join these segments of tracks. Another um, method which has been proposed in, uh, by Stefano Baldan and implemented uh, as a functional model tracker in the sound design toolkit is somehow in between, um, in between a scene carving and peak tracking. And as in peak tracking, it extracts a matrix of spectrogram peaks frame by frame. But then, as in scene carving, it creates a matrix of accumulated uh, sums and it extracts partials one by one with backtracking. Um, model tracker and scene carving apl apply to the same uh, impact sound for the extraction of, for example, seven partials, um, give uh, slightly different results. Some of the partial extracted are the same, some others are different, but resynthesis with a significant number of uh, tracks extracted is quite similar. But it's important to notice that uh, model tracker is much, much faster than scene carving. And this is due to the fact that it assumes uh, the sound is made of uh, um, attenuating components that deviate a little in frequency. In this same conference, you can also check the paper by Tiraboski and other who propose uh, another technique for um, extracting the parameters of uh, decaying resonances and compare their work with the uh, Stefano Baldan algorithm. Um, and now let, let's see how um, audio scene carving behaves uh, uh, with some important sounds for uh, auditory scene analysis or sounds that um, are often used to explain some phenomena, some perceptual phenomena uh, that are explained by uh, Gestalt principles such as proximity or good continuation. Uh, one phenomenon is this of uh, a a tone that is uh, interrupted by noise, if the uh, noise is loud enough, the tone is perceived as continuous. In this other example, there are two uh, steady tones that are interrupted by a band of noise and then start the, um, gliding. And uh, there is a continuity of the tones within the noise. So the question is, how do these methods of uh, um, frequency tracks extraction uh, behave with these kinds of sounds? Well, this is a, a spectral carving. And it's clear that it follows the prominent signs, uh, even going through large bands of noise without interruption. While on the other hand, the model tracker fails, and it also fails to go through the band of noise. What about peak tracking? Uh, here, it, it's, uh, it's, it really depends on the parameters of peak tracking. The, uh, for example, the delta, which is the, the width of the um, search, the width for searching frequency continuity, and the number of signs that are extracted. But uh, typically, uh, even with the best parameters, there are some local oscillations that are not really perceptually uh, meaningful. Other um, interesting phenomena are streaming phenomena, where there, there are concurrent uh, streams and ambiguous streams. And these are some examples of this. Indeed, perception tends to privilege bouncing over crossing uh, in both cases, and this, indeed, this is indeed what scene carving does as well. So it extracts a, st a stream that is compatible with uh, auditory perception. So summarizing spectral carving is an algorithmic technique based on spectrogram energy. 
it's implemented by dynamic programming and backtracking on energy matrix, so, so it is uh, fairly uh, efficient. It's robust to noise, and it reproduces some auditory continuity illusions and segregation phenomena. Thanks for your attention. Hello, my name is Adrián Barahona Rios, and I will present the paper Synthesizing Knocking Sound Effects Using Conditional Wave GAN by myself and Sandra Pauleta. So, why consider synthesizing sound effects in the first place? Well, when it comes to interactive media, it is very common to use several slightly different sounds for an individual action, just to avoid repetition in case a user interacts with it more than one time. On the other hand, procedural audio allows for the synthesis of sound effects on demand, using relevant game parameters to produce a unique sound. This paper describes the use of generative adversarial networks, or GANs, for the synthesis of sound effects. GANs are composed by two neural networks, a discriminator and a generator. The discriminator is a classifier, trained on real data, that predicts whether or not a sample is real. The generator samples from a random distribution, typically Gaussian, and produces a sample. The generator has the goal of fooling the discriminator, and it progressively achieves this by training against it. Once the generator is trained, one can sample from the random distribution, pass it through the generator network, and generate a sample that closely resembles the original training data. For instance, if a GAN is trained on a dataset of footsteps on different surfaces, once trained, the generator will produce a sample of one of those surfaces. If we wanted to produce a sample on a specific surface, we could use a conditional GAN. Conditional GANs allow further refine the control of the generator by adding, for instance, a class label, which in our example will be the surface. Two examples of GAN architectures to synthesize audio are WaveGAN and GANSynth. WaveGAN is trained on raw audio or some files and produce raw audio. GANSynth, on the other hand, is trained on different audio representations such as spectrograms and MEL spectrograms. We chose the WaveGAN architecture because it produced good results in virtual environments and we made it conditional. For context, here is a pilot study that we ran on footstep sound effects. What you are about to listen to is the training process of the model, from noise to synthesized footsteps. In this other case, we condition the WaveGAN architecture on the surface. It's interesting to see how the class label makes the sounds diverge over time, considering they were synthesized using the same input. For our run study, we chose knocking sound effects as the subject. We chose knocking sound effects for several reasons. Firstly, they are widely used sounds in media, typically as a transition to another scene. Secondly, they are interesting from a synthesis perspective, having very articulate frequency and time components. In order to train the gun, we decided to produce a dataset of knocking sound effects with five different emotions, anger, fear, happiness, neutral and sadness. We commissioned Foley artist Ulf Olauson to record a dataset of knocking actions, and a total of 500 sound effects, 100 sound effects per emotion, were recorded. We provided Foley artists with different scenarios to perform the knocking actions, and encouraged him to perform diverse interpretations of them. 
the dataset can be accessed online. Here are some examples of the recorded sound effects. In order to understand the dataset and to later compare it with the synthesized sounds, we extracted a series of acoustic features from it. These features are the action duration, the number of knocks per action, the knocking rate, the knocking regularity, and the root mean square energy slope. An example of the root mean square energy slope feature can be seen on the right hand side. The dots represent the knocks in an action, the x axis being time and the y axis the root mean square energy. As you can see, the fit line has a negative slope and therefore the action has a negative energy pattern. And this is the result of the acoustic analysis on the dataset. Once we had the recorded dataset, we trained our conditional waveguide model for 72 hours, and what you see on top is a GIF of the training process of the model. We use most of the original waveguide hyperparameters, and for more details about the architecture, please refer to the paper. Once the model was trained, we synthesized 500 sound effects, 100 per emotion. This took approximately 30 seconds. And here are some examples of the synthesized sounds. When compared to the original dataset, we can see that the acoustic features are quite similar. Here we can see the action duration, and you can see the recorded dataset on the left-hand side and the synthesized sounds on the right-hand side. Here we can see the knocking regularity and the number of knocks per action. And finally, the knocking rate and the root mean square energy slope. To find out whether or not listeners can identify the synthesized sounds from the recorded dataset and to understand how the emotions are perceived, we ran an online listening test. We asked participants to label each sound as recorded or synthesized and to choose which emotion the sound represented best. These are the results of the real or synthesized listening test. 21 participants did the test. On the image on the left, values below 0.5 are no different from random guessing, and values close to 1 represent the participants who were able to consistently recognize the synthesized sounds. Participants with experience in sound design, represented by the color blue, can distinguish between synthesized and recorded sounds. However, the model is not far from fully known experts, represented in red. Regarding the emotion labeling, most emotions are correctly labeled in the recorded and synthesized sounds. In both cases, anger and fear are confused with each other. In summary, we studied the synthesis of knocking sound effects using a conditional waveguide architecture. Synthesized sounds can be recognized by experts, but they are not far from fully non-experts. 
Intended emotions are generally recognized in both the recorded and the synthesized sounds. Thank you for listening. Buongiorno. My name is Leonardo Fierro. I'm a doctoral student and member of the Acoustics Lab of Alto University in Finland. I'm here today to talk to you about timescale modification and more in particular I'm going to present an evaluation method for timescale modification techniques based on the comparison of the energy curves of the spectral components of an audio signal and its time stretch version. Also, I'm going to propose a first approach to objective evaluation of such techniques based on a metric derived from such energy curves. So, let's start. Timescale modification is the process of changing the duration or the playback speed of a sound without affecting its frequency content. Uh, the need for high-quality timescale modification of audio is increasing as media streaming services are providing new related functionalities to their users. YouTube, for example, allows to change the video playback speed during reproduction. Audiobooks are offering speed reading functions and the chance of slowing down words is often requested when learning a new language. Plus, Timescale modification has been long used in music to alter audio signals in an artistic way or to sync recorded sounds during mixing. Timescaling is applied when slow motion is involved or when media content has to be conformed to a given time slot, as it often happens in TV or radio broadcasting. In this presentation, I am going to show the fuzzy classification of spectral beams of an audio signal into the tones, transients and noise components. I am going to derive energy curves for each and every one of these spectral components and I'm going to use those for the evaluation of different timescale modification methods. I'm going to provide a visual evaluation and a performance evaluation. In the second part of the presentation, I'm going to show the first steps towards a possible objective evaluation of timescale modification methods. At the end, we will have a conclusion that summarizes the presentation and shows possible future work for this topic. An effective timescale modification algorithm should be able to preserve the quality of the tonal, transient and noise component of the sound after the timescaling. Just to give you a hint, here is an audio sample. A castanet over a violin. This is its tonal part. Its transient part. and its noise component. A fuzzy classification allows spectral beams to be described by their simultaneous contribution to tones, transients and noise in a time frequency representation of the signal. Tonal and transient spectrograms are computed using medium filters, which highlight the desired component and suppress the opposite one. Tones appear as time direction flat lines in a spectrogram and conversely transients appear as frequency direction flat lines. The medium filtered STFTs are then used to compute membership functions as described in 2017 paper from Damshak and Valimaki. We are going to derive tonalness, transientness and noisiness. The relationship between the three spectral components is shown in this figure. As we can see, tonalness and transientness have kind of opposite behavior, while noisiness has its peak, its maximum, in the confusion area where tonalness and transientness assume almost equal values. Membership functions can then be used as soft masks for the STFT of an audio signal to individually evaluate the behavior of the three spectral components, namely the XI, where I is either the tonal, the transient, or the noise part. Under the strong hypothesis that perfect time stretching involves conservation of energy for tones, transients and noise, we can think of investigating the energy curves of the spectral components of an audio sample scaled with multiple techniques, comparing them against the energy curves of the original, non-scaled input. A temporal energy curve for each component is easily computed once the soft masks 
are applied. The idea is that each curve should reflect the spectral behavior of the associated component. So for example, the tonal curve should resemble a slowly varying event, while the transient curve should present quick energy bursts interspersed by gaps of low energy. Uh, these curves should also provide a deeper understanding of the energy distribution in the signal before and after the time stretch. So now, the following step is to confront an input signal with its time scale version by means of their energy curves and evaluate the goodness of the applied time scale modification method. Uh, note that the time scale output has a different time axis with respect to the original signals, so we need to introduce a certain amount of interpolation. Uh, considering a time scale, modif time scale modification factor of alpha, we need to interpolate the time axis of the original signal by a factor alpha. A primary evaluation can be conducted by studying uh, the input and output audio files from the listening test uh, conducted for the 2017 paper of Damshak and Valimaki. Among the samples, we find some noisy drums, the a cappella of Susan Vega's Tom's Diner, and a sequence of castanets over a violin, which we have been listening to previously during this presentation. Among the tested timescale modification methods, we can find the phase vocoder, the fuzzy PV from Damshak and Valimaki, and Elastic, a state-of-the-art commercial algorithm present in pretty much uh, every DAW. Of course, they're gonna be compared with the original non-stretch audio sample. Visually, the hypothesis of conservation of energy of the separate spectral components appears to be valid. Here, for example, I'm showing the curves for the tonal, transient, and noise components of the Castanet violin sample with a TSM factor of two. The curves reveal that novel techniques nicely follow the spectral behavior of tones and transients of the input signal, and that the noise component gives an important contribution to the overall energy. It is also peculiar how the spectral energy of the noise component curves strongly resembles the transient ones, hinting that transients in the audio input, in this case the Castanet violin, probably have a strong noise component. As expected, the phase vocoder has the worst performances among the tested timescale modification methods. The visual evaluation allows us to spot immediately some of the most common artifacts introduced by timescale modification. For example, tonality loss for the phase vocoder is immediately spotted. Here are some examples of tonality loss. This is the original file. And this is the time scaled one. We have another example here, the original. And the time stretched. I'd say that in both cases the tonality loss is pretty evident. Typical transient artifacts also emerge from the comparison of the fuzzy energy curves. Um, we have one case of transient duplication, still for the Castanet violin sample, with the phase vocoder. This is the original. And this is the time stretched. The duplication is pretty evident. But also, we can spot when transient smearing happens. For example, with this plot on the right, we can see how with the drum solo sample, the fuzzy PV fails to accurately follow the offset of this first transient and consequently misses the steep transition into the second one. And this is confirmed by listening to the time stretch track. So this is the original. And this is the time stretched. The smearing is clearly audible. In order to have a better understanding of the TSM performances, we can evaluate the energy deviation of the TSM outputs with respect to the non-scaled input, considering the energy curves for the non-decomposed tracks. The goodness of the elastic is immediately visible as its deviation is almost always around 0 dB, although we don't have that much information on the individual components. Fuzzy PV instead suffers from what seems to be a constant energy loss, which might be a consequence of loudness mismatch between the input and the output tracks, or maybe the non-perfect reconstruction uh, due to the subdivision into the spectral components. So for this reason, energy deviation curves for each fuzzy component can be normalized by matching the input and the output mean deviations. With this visual representation, 
the fuzzy face vocoder appears to be the better overall technique for the aforementioned sample. And this is reflected by the listening test of Damshak and Valimaki. The tonal component is quite well preserved, while, for example, using the fuzzy PV, a lot of the transient energy appears to be converted into noise energy after the time stretching, thus providing a sort of explanation for the poor performances of fuzzy PV with transient dominant sounds, as stated in the paper. It may be also of interest to produce a performance score for timescale modification algorithms using the information and the knowledge provided by the derived energy deviation curves. Ideally, the objective score should closely match the subjective mean opinion score that would result from a formal listening test. A simple way of using the energy curves to synthesize a final score is to compute the mean square error for every spectral component and then use linear regression to model a relationship between the energy deviations and the mean opinion score values from the listening test. Different regression models have been generated, first using data from a single timescale modification factor, in our case 1.5 and then 2, and then combining the datasets. Coefficients for each model are reported in this table, and as it can be seen, all the models correctly try to set a bias of 3, which is the central value in the mean opinion score scale. Also, we can see how the noise and the transient components are more relevant for the score with respect to the tonal part, which makes sense since pretty much every method is capable of reconstructing and matching the curves of the tonal part quite well. Finally, I am reporting the real mean opinion score and the estimated objective scores using the combined model for some samples and different stretching factors and TSM algorithms. Uh, the best real and predicted scores have been highlighted in bold. And the good thing is that the best results from the linear regression score and the subjective mean opinion score almost always coincides. Clearly, the amount of data available from the listening test is not enough to generate an accurate model, and it is very unlikely that a linear function alone is entirely capable of describing the relationship between these energy curves and a subjective mean opinion score. However, I think this is a really good starting point to move towards an objective evaluation of timescale modification method, at least in my opinion. So, in this presentation, we have moved the first steps towards objective evaluation of timescale modification methods. Energy curves for the tonal, transient, and noise spectral components of sound have been proposed to analyze timescale modified signals. A visual inspection of such curves highlights typical impairments appearing in time-stretched audio. A possible use of such curves has been suggested to objectively evaluate the sound quality of time-stretched signals. A linear regression model has been proposed, however its accuracy is insufficient to replace the listening test. We probably need, in a future work, a non-linear model to go from subjective to objective. For this reason, it might be meaningful to gather more data from new listening tests to train a neural network which is capable of modeling this relationship. So this presentation has come to an end. I hope I haven't bored you that much. And this is pretty much all. I thank you for your time and I hope to see you all very soon. Goodbye. Okay, um, yep, uh, thanks to everybody for attending this session. I know we had some technical problems, but uh, luckily they got resolved and we, uh, we saw the presentations. Um, so we've got some questions uh, um, for, uh, for Davide Roqueso, and who answered some of them, I think, in the chat, but I wonder if he would like to go over a couple of them again.
Um, so we've got some questions. Um, Hi. Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a couple of more questions uh, that remained unanswered. Uh, just to not take time from my colleagues, perhaps I can keep answering over the chat. So because I became I became so proficient with my fingers that. Uh, well, um, how about how about answering one of them just live, just so we can uh, we can hear okay. you talk a bit. <laughs> So, okay. Uh, one question was if uh, carving could be used to explore auditory perception. Uh, my quick answer is that I would rather uh, see if it matches perception in some uh, relevant cases to justify its use for some applications, such as uh, audio restoration, as it was suggested indeed. I would rather uh, see if it matches. Mm, and another question, so I, I reply uh, <laughs> by voice, uh, by Andrea Agostini is if we tried it with non-STFT uh, representations, the answer is no, uh, we have been using the SMS framework, uh, other representations would add more computational complexity at the analysis stage, but it may be interesting, of course, we haven't done it. Okay. Um, so we had. Oh, do you want to? Do you want to continue? Or uh, no? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. So just for Leonardo now, maybe um, could you tell us a bit more about the the particular types of soft masks that you used? Um, well, um, definitely. I've been uh, using the same membership function that I've been used by um, Damshak in his paper. So. Um, basically, I'm using the medium filters to derive a certain uh, description of how much tonal, how much transients we have uh, for each particular STFT bin, and reusing those to, to detect, to gather basically three different uh, membership functions according to uh, fuzzy classification theory. Uh, the curious fact is that those membership functions that uh, we have used uh, basically do not sum up to one, so using those masks, uh, we don't have a perfect, uh, a, we don't, we block ourselves on the possibility of having a perfect construction of the signal, but luckily this is not what we are looking forward here, but that's definitely like something we are working on to improve, for example, and some possible new research on the topic. Um, basically, the curious, the curious part about those is that they highlight quite easily, basically just using the medium filters and then doing some a little bit of math, uh, they highlight quite nicely all the features that we were looking for. So it was very easy to go from there to get some kind of even visual or data like statistical description of the components we were looking for. Um, great. And I think um, I don't see any more questions. So maybe uh, we should uh, wrap up here. And I wanted to thank the presenters for uh, for hanging in there during the session. Um, and um, I guess we'll, thanks very much. <laughs>